All right, I now have my cheetah readers from Amazon. You get like a five pack for about $15. I feel pretty good about this. I keep having to up the uh, intensity of the lens every time I turn around. I think what's happening is I'm getting old. Um, I mean, I, I don't know, a lot of you are still young. You'll hit a point where you're looking in the mirror and like, that, that cannot be me. That just cannot be me. In my brain, I'm still very immature in my 20s. And it's like, who is this guy? Um, so yeah, as you heard, I was appointed by Governor Schwarzenegger uh, to our court back in uh, 2010. And uh, when I was going through the vetting process, um, the state bar has to review you and they get all these questionnaires. And one of the concerns that was raised about me was uh, humor. And I guess it's inconsistent to have a judge with a sense of humor. And so I literally had to convince them that I would try to keep it in check. In fact, I promised the governor's appointment secretary that if appointed, I would never tell a joke again. And I've broken that many times. I, my staff wishes I would keep that bow. I'm sort of known for the bad dad joke thing in court. So yeah, who knows? You might get lucky. I might roll one out here today. We don't know. Um, I'm glad for those of you who are here attending in person uh, that we could give you our best weather uh, and our, our clearest skies. You're welcome on behalf of the Chamber of Commerce, okay? Um, I am truly honored to uh, join all of you uh, here today, both in person uh, and online, uh, because of the work that you do. And uh, you know, for those of you who endeavor to provide treatment, uh, to those who are suffering from addiction or substance use disorders or whatever the phrase might be, or have co-occurring diagnoses with serious mental illness, I'm keenly aware that it's not for the faint of heart and that um, it is quite a roller coaster uh, when a person, you're trying to get them to find a path toward sobriety and then stay on said path once they've discovered it. Um, and, you know, for those who in debates want to say, well, narcotics, it's a victimless crime. And I say, okay, well, ask someone's family, their friends, their coworkers, how victimless is it? Or do you feel the ripples and the effects of the fact that your loved one has been lost for some period of time to the ravages of whatever the drug might be that kind of rewired their brain? And so what I love nothing more than anything else, that's why I've done these courts now for so many years, is to see lives getting restored. And I love those graduations of when the families show up and suddenly they've got their daughter back, they've got their father back, they've got their sibling back, they've got their grandmother back or whatever it is. And just seeing right, the, the pure joy uh, that they're all uh, celebrating. I also, on a selfish level, um, you know, I think we all went through a lot during the pandemic, and I know I did, including a divorce and death of my 90-year-old uh, mother, and uh, it was a, you know, kind of a rough time, and I know I struggled pretty hard during some of it, and frankly, it was my court participants who kind of gave me the resilience, like, you know, if they're keeping it together, Larry, um, and all the adversities that they're dealing with day in and day out, and they're going to their meetings, and they're testing, and they're coming to court, and they're whatever it is that they've got going on, you, you can get your act together and get through this, right? So I get a lot of selfish things uh, from working in uh, these courts. Uh, there's also hardship, though. I'm just going to mention briefly Two weeks ago, we lost a young man uh, to, in our recovery treatment court, which is also the name we use for our drug court now, uh, Jared. And Jared was all of 24 years old. And uh, I had Jared with me for over two years. And uh, normally it's a one-year program at most, and we're going to kick you out and all that. But much to the DA's chagrin, I'm a softie, so it takes a lot for me to go ahead and pull the trigger and delete somebody from the court when it appears that they are really still wrestling with their sobriety. And uh, Jared certainly was just that. We used every tool in the tool book, but I don't think he did medical assisted treatment. I was thinking about that. 
uh, with this conference. Now he had both heroin and uh, methamphetamine addiction, I recall. And uh, we had him do everything from our jail-based treatment program at our branch jail, which I'll be talking about, which is actually quite a fine program. It's several months long with wonderful counselors to a residential program to yet another residential program. He graduated at the end of July. And uh, we saw him on calendar uh, on a Monday, just a couple of weeks ago on Zoom. Looked good, sounded good. And he's one of those guys who um, you all know them, right? Like when he's not doing well, you know it. He could not hide the fact he'd been using. It just, he totally changed. His affect was flat. There wasn't the wit, there was none of the energy. But boy, when he was sober, he was this dynamic, just kind young man with a wonderful sense of humor. And that's who we saw on that Monday, seemingly. And then within two days, we get the email from our probation supervisor that uh, he was in ICU. And then we found out what we all suspected. He probably overdosed. He did and within the next week, he'd passed. And I know you all have, I'm sure, experienced loss. Uh, it's almost impossible to avoid it when working in the treatment field. And I was not surprised at all that my entire team, including probation, including the prosecutor and the public defender and the treatment folks and everybody, we all took it hard. And uh, we have kind of all powwowed a bit and talked a bit about it and offered each other you know, support in the process. Uh, but for every one of those cases, of course, we have so, so many positive, successful outcomes. And that's why we all keep doing, I think, you know, what it is that we're doing. Um, let me uh, thank the uh, project director of this Hub and Spoke program, Dr. West, for uh, inviting me to speak here. I think she was looking to save money. She needed there'd be no travel expenses. All I had to do was just, I live like 10 minutes from here and the courthouse is like 10 minutes, not even 10 minutes from here. So I just found a judge to cover like, you'd be really good, Judge Brown. We really think you should be the speaker. Uh -huh. So yeah, I'm used to, it's fine. Um, you know, it's a true privilege to serve on this. I don't know if anybody's from Santa Clara County, either here or online, but if you have ever caught Judge Stephen Manley's act from Santa Clara County, kind of the godfather of the collaborative court movement across the state, Dr. West and I serve on his mental health subcommittee, and uh, the man must be close to 80 years old and has the energy that I've never had in my life, let alone at age 40 or whatever it would have been. Uh, so we just try to keep up as best we can. Um, I think the purpose of my presentation here today is to talk a little bit about the intersection between treatment and the court system, the criminal justice system. And goodness knows we see a lot of it. Uh, I think we all know that if we could eliminate uh, addiction and uh, cure serious mental illness for people, um, we'd pretty much shut down at least 80%, I'd say, of our county criminal courts, right? I always say it's like, you know, uh, certainly we have a certain number of very select offenders that I think societally we'd all say, they scare me. We need to lock that person up because they are a murderer, they're a, a sex offender, whatever it might be. But that is a very small section of what's coursing through our county courthouses every day. It's folks typically who are suffering from having a substance use disorder and or untreated uh, serious mental illness. And they act out in a way that happens to then violate the penal code, the health and safety code, whatever code it might be, and that's a crime. And they might get arrested and they get booked in jail. And then the system needs to figure out, what do we do with this person? And as I'll be talking about, I think we're still kind of engaged in an experiment about what is it do we do with this person? And as we all know, the pendulum swings back and forth in dramatic ways in terms of a pure lock them up approach to a let's not lock anybody up approach and then something in between. I saw with the Memphis 
uh, murders that occurred last night, that the mayor there was decrying, uh, you know, the fact that people are getting released early and getting too many credits, so many truth in sentencing and all that. And we've been down this road so many times before, right? It's like, okay, now I guarantee you in the Tennessee legislature, we will see bills that will deal with all these issues driven by that particular matter. Well, California is uh, certainly no different than that, whether it's by legislation just down the street or whether it's by voter initiative, we all <laughs> find our work impacted sometimes in very significant altering ways. I'm gonna talk a bit about that as well. On this intersection of uh, treatment and uh, the court system, just coincidentally, uh, just yesterday at our monthly criminal uh, meeting for the criminal judges, a uh, representative from our substance use prevention treatment agency, Kimberly Grimes, presented uh, to the judges about trying to demystify how do you get a person assessed for a drug treatment program? What are these levels of care between outpatient, intensive outpatient, residential, different residential programs? What is an ROI, right? And to do it outside of the drug court which I support fully. It shouldn't be that a person has to get the magic ticket to end up in one of our collaborative courts in order to get treated. We serve a role, but for every one case I have, there's gonna be cases all across my courthouse who would have many of the same equities that need to be addressed in terms of that person not spending a bunch of time behind bars, but to get treated for whatever issue it is that belies them. So, um, but you can see, I can see my colleagues like, what the hell are they talking about? What is all this stuff? And frankly, I live this and I've heard it many times and I still sit there and go, now what the hell, what we do what now? What number do they call? What? And <laughs> so if nothing, if nothing else, I'm always reminded like we need to streamline as very best we can and make as simple as possible the pathways for persons to get treatment because God knows. We start throwing around the jargon. Ah, you, I just get lost. It's like when IT comes to help me at my desk computer and I'm like, I don't know what the hell you're talking about. I used to have a guy who was in our uh, financial department in a prior job and he would always use all the jargon. I said, look, that'd be like if I start saying to you, well, it appears to be race ipsa loquitur. And uh, I mean, I could start throwing a bunch of legal terms at you and it'll mean nothing. So how do we streamline things and make it simple enough that when people want to kind of do the right thing and connect somebody up, is it feasible? Or do we just sort of give up because, well, this is a big pain in the rear. All right, I think I have slides. By the way, on this conference, there's a good and bad to this. It's a very anal retentive planning group. I don't know if it's because of West or somebody else, but I had to get my slides prepared and submitted like a month ago at least. That's not me. <laughs> I would be doing it this morning, right? Last night at the earliest, like, oh shit, is that tomorrow? <laughs> Pardon my French. Now, the good news is I got it done. I didn't stress this week in terms of, hey, I've already got my slides in. Good job, Larry. You got your homework done early. Very unlike a procrastinator due to anxiety. Sorry, oh, that's a topic for therapy. And uh, but the downside was I kind of forgot what my slides looked like. So I was looking at them last night. Like, oh, is that what I put? So there are some teachable moments in these slides that you and I are going to discover together. <laughs> because as I get older, my memory is awful. I keep diagnosing myself with early stages of dementia. I'm just convinced. And everybody's like, no, no, no. It just happens to be your late 50s. This is just what happens in life. Like, damn it. Unless you're Judge Manley. All right. Uh, I know I pressed something. Oh, down here. And then there's a disclosure. Blah, 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 blah. Okay. National Recovery Month, they added that, which I appreciated because, right, exactly, who, who was right, right? Right, I like the recovery part, don't we? That's the happy part, right? So, and again, thank you for the work you all are doing to make this month actually mean something. Now, here are my slides. 
you can tell because I've got the scales of justice in the background. I am so um, limited in my PowerPoint abilities. I learned it like 20 years ago and thought, whoa, look at me. I'm high tech. I've never improved my skills since. And I, like, I'll go to these conferences and people are having things swoop in and move around and all this great stuff. I'm like, I, wow, that's great. Um, I use this. All right, so uh, working with your mental health and drug courts and uh, kind of the larger concept of kind of getting diverted from our judicial system, the person's still in our system as it were, but if nothing else, we divert them from being behind bars, whether it's jail or county jail prison under realignment or whether good old state prison. That's the goal of these courts. Um, the shift toward treatment, I think is ongoing. I think there is a trend toward treatment, particularly when I compare it to when I started out as a deputy district attorney in Ventura County, California, in 1989, I still had some hair. I was very self-conscious about the fact it was thinning. Now I look back and go, oh, look at you. You look like a Kennedy. <laughs> what I wouldn't do. But back then, um, we didn't talk a lot about treatment for drug use. And I remember very distinctly um, being assigned to a grant that came out of the governor's office of criminal justice planning. That was for misdemeanor 11550 under the influence. And the goal of the grant was to get as long as sentences as you could to incarcerate people. Because we all knew if you incarcerate a person, that was one less burglary, vehicle theft, what have you, that would occur during the time of their incarceration. And you'd have people on five grants of probation for 11550, all the search terms. They all lived in uh, one particular area in Oxnard in the barrio. It was like uh, shooting fish in a barrel or the narcotic cops from Oxnard PD to walk down the street and say, I see dilated pupils, we exercise search terms, we did a test and they were positive for whatever. And our method was to serve 90 days last time, that didn't do it. We're giving you 150 this time, we'll show you. And that didn't cure the addiction, they got out and then we gave them 210, 240 a year. Even I knew as a youngster, that this didn't seem like a great approach to dealing with an addiction. And I remember the foreperson of the grand jury came and observed what we were doing one day. And he's like, look, um, doesn't it kind of seem wrong that you, all you have are all these kind of people of color, largely uh, uh, Hispanic, as we call it that time, and at Oxnard, who are coming through your court system. What about all the white kids in Thousand Oaks? Like, yeah, I know they're not on probation with search terms. It's harder. You got to go bust a party or something or have somebody go undercover at the high school, whatever it is. Uh, and that's a lot more work. So this is easy stuff. That's where things were. And I, um, this sounds like a true confessional because you're like, okay, so he was a deputy DA. He's talking about treatment. I then became the executive director of the California District Attorneys Association, which is how I got to Sacramento. So I was the head of the state district attorney organization for a number of years, lobbying on a lot of the tough on crime legislation because I came here in 1994 when the three strike law was pending and all that stuff. And I can assure you that during that time, there was not a lot of talk, again, about treatment. So much of it was about, we need longer sentences. We need to lock up more people. We need to build more prisons. That's how we will right, protect the community. And at some level, that's true. I think even Dr. Marlowe for uh, the National Drug Court would acknowledge if you incarcerate somebody for that period of time, sure, they're not gonna necessarily have as much access, they might have some, but less access to narcotics. They're not going to commit some crime, true. But at what cost? And to what end? So they come back out again, still addicted? So we have made, progress. And I want to talk a bit more about that. A lot more. On drug courts, you had this sort of early movement going on out of Miami-Dade County in 1986. 
And the state's attorney, which was your local district attorney, was a woman named Janet Reno. And she was part of a team to help create the court. Well, it just so happened that Janet Reno then becomes United States Attorney General under President Clinton and says, we've had this wonderful program in Miami-Dade. And they said, you know what we should do is we should kick out significant dollars from the United States Department of Justice to incentivize states to create these drug courts all across the country. And that's what they did. And those of us who in government know, give us money, we're there. We'll do almost anything you throw money at us. So these courts started to pop up all over the country. Now we have thousands of these courts across the country, including in such places as dependency court, when a child's removed from the home, and are you gonna be able to reunite the child with one of the biological parents or what have you, if the person can get on top of their addiction? What you need to know about drug courts is that there's no one model. And these are gonna vary county by county. So if you have on your to-do list at some point, like, do we have a drug court? What's it look like in LA County and El Dorado County and Sacramento and wherever, okay, Orange County? Um, these are developed locally. There's no law that mandates that a drug court be created. It takes basically the local stakeholders to agree, we're gonna have a drug court. And then you have a debate over who gets in, what offenses, what's the criteria for successful performance? What's the criteria for deletion? What happens if they graduate, is the case dismissed or not, blah, blah, blah. And that's gonna reflect in some ways sort of the mores of that community. If you're in a tough on crime jurisdiction, it's probably gonna look different than if you're in a very progressive jurisdiction. And so there will be some differences that do go on even with a neighboring county. I look different here than does Placer County, then does El Dorado County, then does Yolo County. It's the same concept. And the concept is basically you've got your court, your prosecutor, your defense bar, probation, and your county alcohol and drug or substance use prevention treatment and the treatment community coming together to do something to try to treat people who are in the criminal justice system rather than just having them behind bars. So fundamentally, that's going to be a common thread. So many courts historically were limited to felony narcotics possession. It's a drug court. Person possesses cocaine, get them a drug court program, right? And the approach in these courts is typically almost the same. You take the jail or prison term that a person would otherwise be looking at. You have them plead guilty or no contest. You suspend that jail or prison time over them like a sword of Damocles. Put them on probation, say, test, stay sober, go to meetings, come to court regularly. If you do that, you'll graduate and typically your case will get dismissed, right? And normally it's going to take eight months, a year, depending on how that court is set up. And this team is going to work together and speak with one another from their different backgrounds and talk about a shared objective of treatment. No matter if you're the prosecutor, the judge, probation, defense, or treatment, right? In our, for our Judicial Council of California, which is kind of my mothership uh, in San Francisco, they say drug courts are a specially designed court calendar that provide an alternative to traditional justice prosecution for nonviolent drug related offenses. They combine judicial oversight with probation supervision and substance abuse treatment services, as I described. Sometimes this is called, would you believe, therapeutic jurisprudence blending, I guess, my line of work with your line of work. And we call it therapeutic jurisprudence. It just rolls off the tongue, doesn't it? You guys, if nothing, if you learn nothing else, you'll walk away like, hey, therapeutic jurisprudence. Cool. Thanks, Judge Brown. 
So drug courts were kind of the first of what have become known as collaborative justice courts or sometimes called problem solving courts. And frankly, that's one of the great legacies of drug courts is when it was proven that, hey, this model works. Could we now take it and apply it to other problems that we see in the criminal justice system with a similar model of having the team work together and suspend jail or prison and have them come in front of a judge every week and all that type of stuff and the case gets dismissed if they graduate? Could we apply it to other type of things? And what these collaborative courts do, I often say, is sort of, it's different. Normally in criminal justice, we focus on what did the person do? What crime is alleged that they committed? Is the prosecutor being greedy with the charges that have been brought? Is there going to be a plea bargain worked out with their public defender? Is it going to trial? It's all focused on what did they do? Whereas in the collaborative courts, I always say I hardly ever remember what it was the person was alleged to have done when they came into the court. It's who are they? What makes them tick? What can we do to address their underlying criminogenic needs? I've been in enough conferences now. I can say criminogenic. I still can't spell it. Every time I try, I get the squiggly line on PowerPoint. So I've given up. So what has happened is the next wave for mental health treatment courts. Let's do the same thing. Let's focus on somebody with serious mental illness. Um, I now regularly share something I never shared in the past. I have a sister who's paranoid schizophrenic. And, uh, you know, uh, <laughs> she got involved in the criminal justice system probably a good 40 years ago uh, when she first had her break. And uh, it's been a long 40 years. I'm now her special needs trustee. She's delightful, still a lover but uh, you lose someone to mental illness, it's not an easy thing. Anyway, so what we do is we focus on that person's underlying mental health issues. And we say, take your medication as prescribed. Go to your appointments, stay sober, come to court regularly. And so I've now got about 150 folks on probation to me any given time and another 70 or 80 on diversion these days who I see regularly. It's the same model. We also went ahead and did it for veterans because by God, that's the right thing to do. Veterans, I didn't realize until I went to one of the training programs, you know, they, it's such a small percentage of people who are now veterans as compared to when my father was drafted for the Korean War back in the day. There were a lot of veterans when he came home. Now it's a very small percentage of folks. It's very isolated when you come home. And so the experiences you had in theater of war, in Afghanistan, Iraq, wherever it may have been, it's hard for people to understand what that is. They come back to a trauma or what have you, and they act out many times alcohol. I have a lot of DUIs. I have a lot of domestic violence cases, right? A lot of firearm <laughs> type cases or what have you. Same idea, though. We're going to address who this person is, and we're going to have the VA give them services, and we're going to have a mentor for them. And we're going to get them through and get the case graduated. I love this court because they're the most respectful group of participants I've ever had in my life. I've never been called sir so much and thank you, your honor. And oh, and yes, sir. I'm like, oh my God. I, I don't get a lot of that in uh, mental health court. They like me, but I just, it's not the same. Even driving under the influence courts now, which I'm going to talk about uh, in just a bit, driving an influence treatment courts for alcoholism. This was, to me, boom, really. The court I preside over are for third, fourth, and fifth DUIs. Fourth and fifths are felonies. Fifth sends you to state prison. And I'm suspending time and having them do, I have a calendar this afternoon, probably 40-something people on. And we're treating the alcoholism. And we've had some wonderful results doing it. I was shocked that our prosecutor's office was willing to run this experiment in Sacramento County. We're a somewhat law and order county. Sacramento is fascinating. It's a purple county. Like the city is blue, the surrounding areas are red. And so <laughs> trying to get consensus about what we think our justice system should look like can be interesting. Um, 
With drug courts, judges, probation, prosecutors, public defenders, we all know one another. We work with each other or against each other each and every day. That's our line of work. Folding in county alcohol and drug, let alone community-based treatment, that was a new thing, right? It's like, hey, come, come join this clique and you tell us what you do. And then we'll have our biases and our reactions as to what you're doing. And you can try to educate us, but take it slow. Don't you know, patronize the judge when you talk to him or her because they don't like that. You gotta be real careful how you talk to the judge. I'm scared of judges. Still, I've been a judge for 12 years. And what you're gonna find is if you're doing any of this work, it's not uncommon that while you stay out of our lane, we go into your lane regularly. We will have ideas about treatment. No, this person should be in residential, even though the assessment said it shouldn't be. It should be 90 days residential, even though after 30 days, they reassess the person and said they're fine. They should go to intensive outpatient or an SLE or whatever. Like, wait a second. It should be 90. Why? Because that's longer. And if it's residential, it's almost like having them in jail, sort of. That feels better. That's how my mindset was when I started doing some of this work was, good job, Lair. You're letting this person out of jail to go to residential. And they better stay there. They better be for 90, right? So we will get into your lane repeatedly. You're welcome. Some of the things have gone on that have challenged doing treatment in the criminal justice system, I would submit, are some of the following. Certainly, uh, I go to 1115, right? Oh, good. Doing okay? Good. So I can just, then like, and so in third grade, oh, no, I'll be back to the slides. So, <laughs> it's the early years. You're going to love it. No. This may surprise you, but I was lousy at sports, kind of a geek. Shocking. I know. All right. Back to the lecture. So Prop 36, for those of you who've been around a while, may recall this was on the ballot in November 2000. And uh, frankly, I was the head of the state district attorney organization at that very time. And we were very opposed to this ballot measure. And uh, we then joined forces with the Drug Court Professionals Association of California, who was also opposed to Prop 36 because Prop 36 did not have the same tools that drug courts have for the court. You couldn't lock people up easily on a sanction, for example. You or hands were tied that if they had a drug related violation, you'd say, don't do that again and keep them on probation. They do it again, don't do that again. It wasn't until the third time they could be deleted from Prop 36. That was very different than drug court. That's how I bonded with Judge Manley because he got every editorial in the state to come out against it because of the fact that drug courts were a better model, not because he didn't think there should be treatment. I remember with the DAs feeling like, you know, uh, we sure love drug courts now, don't we? When faced with this alternative, drug courts look damn good. We probably should have been on board with this a bit earlier than when it was too late when this ballot measure was on the ballot. That's not to say I don't think there's been a lot of good that's come from Prop 36 or has been. Here's my criticism, though. And it was a criticism at that time. And I'm still pissed about it. They knew what they were doing by keeping the cost of it down by mandating that the legislature shall appropriate $120 million a year for treatment for the first five years. Then it was up to the legislature whether to keep funding it or not. That way, the cost of the ballot measure was X hundreds of millions of dollars, as opposed to an ongoing billions of dollars expense. And I, in debates, would say, what if the money runs out? The provisions on sentencing stay. The hands of the court are still tied. There's gonna be, so money continued. And I lobbied for the funding to continue still. We're like, well, we have it, let's do it. Then the Great Recession came along and the money went away. And so we had kind of a perfect storm of sort of this program with not enough money. And so a lot of great work, I'm, for those who did prop, have done Prop 36, a lot of great work gets done, but they haven't had the resources over time to do everything that needed to be done. And then other things happened, which we'll talk about. Corrections realignment, Assembly Bill 109 in 2011 to address state prison overcrowding. It became at that point that essentially 
no drug offense would qualify for state prison any longer. So if the judge denied probation and gave them a term of two years, it'd still be at the jail, not at the state prison. So suddenly the locals are gonna have to own this issue because they're staying home. There'll be some state funding, never enough, but you're gonna have them unless they had a strike prior in their background. Possession for sale, sales, trafficking, didn't matter. You, I had guys who were, uh, it was kilos out of San Bernardino County got caught here. 13, 14 year sentence with the enhancement, all local, two defendants. I had, I had the record for a while. And I split their terms, they were 13 in and five out at the county jail. That was designed to hold people for no more than a year or pending trial. The state bequeathed to the sheriffs and the counties a whole big prison population. A debate can be whether that was good, bad, whatever, it just is, right? That was, had an impact. The most significant impact, of course, would be Prop 47, the ballot measure in 2014, named the Safe Neighborhoods and Schools Act because it was going to generate all this money for schools and safer neighborhoods. It was really about making narcotics possession a straight misdemeanor in California, whether methamphetamine, cocaine, heroin, et cetera. And I'm all for people not getting branded with felonies and living the life of having all the things that come with being a felon. That's why I have the felony expungement calendar to clean up people's records. That's what I'd be doing right now if I weren't here. But it's had a huge impact on drug treatment. 10 minutes. Oh, no, I, I hardly ever take questions because <laughs> then I get embarrassed because I don't have the answer. But nice try with that sign. Yeah, you just, you, you just take that and just crunch it up. Okay? <laughs> That's the one thing about being a judge is you're so used to controlling your environment. And what sucks about it is then when you're like in the real world, you have no power whatsoever, right? Like I'm a big, like I like to keep my courtroom kind of quiet. And the bailiff knows that. People start, I get counsel. Down, please. Go to a restaurant. I so want to like, hey, you, quiet, please. Take your child outside. No children while Judge Brown's dining. There's zero power. It sucks. <laughs> And then Assembly Bill 1950 was enacted in the beginning of 2021 that the length of probation for misdemeanors is now one year, unless it's domestic violence or a couple of offenses, and two years for felonies. But for the misdemeanors, it's significant. But on the good side, of course, we had the Affordable Care Act and things like Medi-Cal to suddenly make folks available, uh, eligible to receive treatment. When I was doing drug court in 2013, it was still, do we have a, we have a grant? I mean, get them to a pro program through the grant. Uh oh, we're running out of grant money. And now it's like, well, all we just say is they have Medi-Cal? Great, let's go. I'm aware of something called Cal-AIM. You all probably know exactly what it's gonna do. Me, all I know is to put it on my slide. And that somehow it's good because people can get linked to services while incarcerated before they get released. That sounds great. If anybody asks a question about that, you can just come to my courtroom later. <laughs> what has happened is with Prop 47, this is not, again, I'm not speaking ill of Prop 47. I get why people voted for it. The practical effect though, is that the going rate for possession of methamphetamine is basically a slap on the wrist now. It's one year informal probation, and typically, it's some work project time. Pick up trash on the side of the freeway. So the going rate of a possession charge, which used to have a potential of sending somebody to state prison for three years, which again, draconian, way extreme. However, boy, that kind of number, that threat, sure led a lot of folks to treatment. But all of a sudden, it's like, their public defender is telling them, like, look, uh, you've been in custody. You already got 10 days in. You've got a credit for time served offer. You'll be on informal probation when you get out. What do you want to do? I'll plead. Or door number two is you can do a year-long Prop 36 program with several phases. You're going to test regularly, and you're going to see the judge regularly. Would you like to do that? And wouldn't that be wonderful if all the people arrested 
were at that moment in their lives to say, yes, that sounds great. I want to change my life. I want to turn my life around and be sober versus I want to get the hell out of jail. I know where I'd be on that. Get me out. When it comes down to the criminal justice system, the conversations most commonly with defense counsel is how much time am I looking at? Which makes total sense. So we've had a dramatic drop off in Prop 36 in Sacramento County. I can't imagine we're alone. At its height, there used to be hundreds. The hallway would be packed. Now, when I turned it over to a colleague of mine a few months ago, I had about a dozen. I spoke with her yesterday. There's about five right now. That's Sacramento County. We've got like, I don't know, million something people. We have about five in Prop 36. Now, on drug courts, the Prop 47 is going to vary. In some jurisdictions, I understand it, um, it has almost shut down drug courts. If you were having just possession of narcotics as your qualifying offense for drug court, and now they're misdemeanors, you're not getting many people. In other jurisdictions, to include mine, if you had felonies in there already that were sort of drug related, uh, vehicle theft, identity theft, possession for sale, if those qualified for your drug court, those still are felonies. And so you're still getting those cases. So I've got a healthy number. My, my numbers are at least half what they were prior to uh, Prop 47. And we're not packing it in. We're not bitterly saying, oh, screw it. We wash your hands of it. And we keep examining our acceptance criteria. Could we expand it? What could we do to try to keep this going? I believe that saving grace for treatment, this might sound political. Uh, and you could tell I had a background in politics for a period of time. Uh, by the way, my party registration is no party preference. I'm sorry, but I just don't think that either party has a full monopoly on everything. I didn't feel like being, you're not a good this, you're not a good that. It's like, oh, you know what I am? I have a brain and I'll decide what I think about various issues. I don't need politicians to tell me or a slight mailer to tell me, this is how you shall vote. So uh, on politics though, what I have seen is that there is a difference with the Jerry Brown and now Gavin Newsom appointees to my court. Uh, it's a more progressive lot, as one would anticipate, who are being appointed. And what I am finding is that there's a greater receptivity, naturally, to the idea of providing treatment rather than locking folks up. So as the old guard, <clears throat> I take that kind of personally, of a bunch of white male prosecutor types or became judges. No, um, as the old guard kind of retires off and had a little bit more of a lock them up mentality, you're having a new generation coming who are going to be more receptive on the natural to trying to do things to help people. The challenge will be, how do you educate the system, right? How do you bridge that divide, particularly outside of a drug court per se? because only so many people are gonna get in. So for treatment, of course, your key allies are gonna be your probation department. That's gotta be the lead, that's gotta be the key is to find out who in the probation department cares about drug treatment. Are they aware of Vivitrol, Suboxone? What are their views on methadone? Is it of the old days of, oh, you're substituting one drug for another? Where are they on the issue? Do they have a meeting on a regular basis that are they, are they hearing from treatment, right? That also be with your county alcohol and drug agency or what we call our substance use prevention treatment agency. Is bridging that, <laughs> getting over that wall and having those conversations to say, look, this is kind of where things are trending. This is the type of things we have available in the community. I really wrestle with, a lot of the times, I can't keep track of what's in the community. You mentioned, oh, the core program, crap, I know that name. Recovery House, crap, I know that name. But there are just so many, and then they change. One thing in the treatment world, right? God, how many acronyms? And they get bought by some other group, and then somebody's, oh, no, that's no longer this. It's now well space. It used to be, it's like, Strategies for change, Judge. I do, you're so lucky. 
I ever knew any name whatsoever. Like, give me literally one of our DAs in the collaborative courts. She has created a grid or a chart with all the abbreviations or all the different stuff to go. Like, this is what this means. Like, thank you. But also, don't forget the sheriff's department. They have a lot of reentry programs they're creating these days because they're keeping these people in jail for much longer periods of time. And many of the sheriffs, including my own, um, have these programs to help people get back in the community and get them treated first and then get connected as they leave. So does your sheriff have a reentry counselor or something of that nature that gets important on the to-do list? Educate stakeholders at standing committee meetings. And that, for certain, like for example, we have a criminal justice cabinet chaired by the presiding judge as the sheriff, the DA, the public defender, et cetera, right? That entity meets every month and people get invited to come and give a presentation. You never know what impact you're gonna have but that little ripple effect by some you're going in and you're saying, we've got this. And all it takes is for that sheriff or that DA or whomever to say, oh, never heard of that. I wanna look into this. That looks like a good idea, right? So you're in. And then you work with the staff. DUI treatment courts um, are emerging. We have about 14 in the 58 counties right now in California. And efforts are being made through Office of Traffic Safety to provide financial assistance. But it's the same concept, as I mentioned before. But it is a little bit harder to get adopted locally many times because of the fact that you're dealing with drunk driving. And people like to lock up drunk drivers. It is one of those crimes where you all kind of go, that's bad, that's dangerous. Any one of us could find ourselves on the wrong end of a drunk driver. Yeah. Finally, and then I can take questions. Mental health court, mental health diversion. Um, mental health diversion was enacted in 2018 as part of the governor's budget. It is the biggest game changer in the criminal justice system that I've seen in my 30 something years now. And I say that because it almost be malpractice for a criminal defense attorney to not be looking at his or her client to say, does my client have a serious mental illness and therefore might qualify for diversion? Court of appeal decisions are coming down reversing cases, sending them back, chastising, saying, you need to look at this. So the entire system over the last four years has like a laser beam focused on mental illness. Our behavioral health clinicians are so overwhelmed right now with referrals, trying to keep up on all these referrals. I look at that as a good problem. That means then that we need more of those folks to be able to do the job that they are doing. And ultimately, Trying to get alcohol and drug agency types and mental health agency types who many times are under the same Department of Behavioral Health to recognize they're working on the same brain and they need to work together. When I had a co-occurring court through a state grant in 2016, I felt like I was negotiating Middle East peace. <laughs> I'd like to introduce you to, you guys have the same letterhead even, different agency name, right? So the challenges continue to go on uh, and they continue to be rather immense resources. Time for questions. We've got eight minutes. How's that? Yes, sir. Thank you. You're welcome. Oh, yeah. The question I wanted to ask you was in regards to the care court. Oh, yes. Right yep. Uh, what's your take on it? And I, I agree with you that mental health diversion is, is what I work in with women and men's re, re entry programs for the Department of Mental Health and Defense. It is a game changer. I agree with you completely. But what do you think of the care courts? That's being um, that. Um, and I didn't mean to. Oh, no, it's fine. I mean, the, well, the governor's right down the street. So it's just, it seems like a great idea. Um, also, what is the care court? Okay, yes, the question was the CARES court. Uh, what do I think of the CARES court? This is Governor Newsom's proposal that has received a lot of attention over this past legislative cycle. It's to sensibly deal with 
mental illness uh, and homelessness in particular. And it was kind of billed as sort of being like, this is gonna be the way that we get people kind of off the streets and no longer in the tents and connect them to treatment. And for the people looking at it as critics to say, oh my God, what are they gonna do? Just round people up and forcibly remove them from the streets and make them go, it's not that. And it, you know, to the extent that maybe it was even kind of sold as that, it ain't that. And it looks a lot like the assisted outpatient treatment, Laura's Law, with a couple of key differences. A couple, the differences are, and let me just back up, because you like, what the hell's Laura's Law? Well, unlike mental health court or mental health diversion, where someone's been arrested for a crime, and now we're looking at, are they getting diversion? Are they going on probation in mental health court? Here in CARES court, as envisioned, and in Laura's law as exists, there's no crime per se. It's not an arrest and you look at, can I get this person out of jail? Instead, it is my daughter has no insight into her mental illness. No matter what I do, she never takes her medication for schizophrenia. She's living on the street. I need help. I can't get a conservatorship because they're almost impossible to get because the LPS law is so restrictive, so stipulated. It's a whole other day, but I couldn't agree more. I don't understand how a law that gets enacted in 1969 is like the holy grail that can't be touched. Thank you. However, what it allows is that a fam that family member can petition. In AOT, Laura's law, they petition county behavioral health. My daughter has had X number 5150s over a certain period of time. They then will offer voluntary services to that daughter. And if she agrees to services, great. It's six months, it can be extended to a year, they never see the judge. If she, dis, if she says, I don't want the services, county council files a petition and they come in front of a judge and we can do what? Order the, order the treatment and say, please do it. I can't put them in custody. I can't, there's no powers really behind it other than they call it the black robe effect, which is a real thing, God bless. It's kind of embarrassing. I always say to my treatment folks, like, uh, I'm just parroting, I know what you said, but I have a really good stage, right? They're in my courtroom. I've got the robe, I've got the props. So help, help me to help you. I'll say what you need me to say. And they go, well, the judge said, I need to take my medication. Poor, you're right, their poor case workers like, yeah, no shit, I've said that for years, but fine. <laughs> so what, what Karis Court does is say, we don't quite trust county behavioral health to do all that. We're gonna have the petitions go directly to a judge. And so it's this whole idea that all the petitions are gonna to come to a CARES court judge. The judge will cause an inquiry to be made about their treatment needs and shall order behavioral health to provide the services that the person needs. If they don't, we can find them up to a thousand dollars a day per patient. And if it's really bad behavioral health, we can order a receivership and appoint someone else to serve as county behavioral health. The judicial council, the judicial branch did not seek those powers. I mean, I can't speak for all the back discussions, but this was what the administration said, look, we want to break what we think to be the log jam in treatment by having it go in front of a judge to really shake things up. The other difference is that in Laura's law, it's county optional. Karis Court, all 58 counties. Finally, Karis Court will be linked to some housing funds. If you're behavioral health and you're being told you need to be housing more people, the common response will be, show me where the beds are. If I got a bunch of open beds in my county somewhere I'm not using right now, let me know. I know in my county, it's a three month wait to get a residential drug treatment spot for a man right now because men get discriminated. No, sorry, that was sorry, kidding, it was a joke. Sorry, it's a female audience. Uh, be, I, grew up, I grew up with three sisters. Never mind. There's women in like two weeks. So we got issues. So that's kind of what CARES Court, there's gonna be a lot of money uh, thrown toward it. I think the plus side is great. If the policymakers wanna keep focusing on mental health, and saying we need to be doing more, fantastic. My only criticism of the state, you can tell I never wanna go for the Court of Appeal, is that it almost feels like they'd love to be out of the business of having to do much with the state hospital stuff and kind of have it all become local. Having been the head of the state DA group in California, 
I'm very sensitive to rural counties and what resources they have or don't have. So if LA, Sacramento, Santa Clara has all these wonderful ideas, well, this is what we do. Well, congratulations. You're not Siskiyou County. What do they have? So there's, that, that's a long answer to, I think it's worth the effort. It ain't gonna fix all the problems. So nothing can ultimately, other than people like you working hard every day, so. I think our last question is that, yeah. Phew, good. Um, I was following along with all the different legislation that you said basically Congress has the Yes, that's exactly it. That's a good question. Thank you. Any other questions? I have like a minute. You do have a minute. I just want to say that. His description of the peer school, which is in that box, which excellent. It is. It's really great, great, great job. Kudos. Thanks. Um, yeah, from a non-study. So it's totally matter. But um, matters a lot. From, it's from a freaking PhD. Jesus. <laughs> so I just think that um, one of the things we don't know. In fact, let me torch the past. So, I, sorry, I just wanted to say um, that Judge Brown did a great job on the CARES Court description, and um, that is exactly the case. And the housing is one of the major issues that's out there. But if you all go to the building Cal um, HSS um, at AHP Nat, I believe is where it is, or, or something like that. Just go to our website. Um, we will get it to you in any case. But the build, um, Behavioral Health Bridge Housing, BHBH, is just getting rolled out right now. It's about $1.5 billion. There will be another $1.5 billion on that additionally. And many of your agencies are actually eligible to apply for that housing for treatment services um, for the um, mental health, uh, the SMI and co-occurring disorders um, treatment programming. And it's really going to be um, supporting a lot of the Laura's Law or AOT CARES Court um, folks that we anticipate you know, coming in. So there's, there is a lot of controversy, but I would highly encourage you to educate yourselves around the CARES Court, um, just so that you understand what um, some different perspectives are from some peer recovery groups, et cetera, that are concerned about it. But I think the way that um, Judge Brown really described it is excellent, um, was a very good description from my point of view, so. Yeah. Great, very good job. We're getting we're getting agreement from the uh, from the yeah yeah getting a. <clears throat> well, that's it. So the kitchen sink. I agree. It's like let's just give it a try. So long as nothing's oversold. Right. right. I'm always I'm always really careful, like in my courts, to like I'm not overselling anything. Right. We're gonna try our very best, but whether it works, whether a person finds their way and graduates and all that, all we can do is do our best effort. So I know we have run out of time. Thank you, Thank Dr. You so West. Much. You're welcome. Thank you for online. I'm sorry you had to look at me.